The history of computing can be thought of as a series of ideas rather than objects. From Aristotle's formalization of the syllogism, to Alan Turing's model for an all-purpose computing machine, to Satoshi Nakamoto's distributed transaction ledger. These breakthroughs did not come in the form of polished, tangible objects like an iPhone. In fact, the objects which end up changing computing fundamentally are often built up from a collection of ideas that seem trivial at first glance. Chris Dixon is a general partner at venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz, and he's the author of the article, How Aristotle Created the Computer. One job of a venture capitalist is to be early in identifying the ideas that will evolve into influential, tangible objects. In this article, Chris examines several instances in the history of computing where ideas that looked weird and impractical at first glance ended up being world-changing. Some recent examples that we discussed are blockchains and neural networks. I really enjoyed this episode with Chris, and I hope you do too. For more than 30 years, DNS has been one of the fundamental protocols of the internet. Yet, despite its accepted importance, it has never quite gotten the due that it deserves. But today's dynamic applications, hybrid clouds, and volatile internet demand that you rethink the strategic value and importance of your DNS choices. Oracle Dyn provides DNS that is as dynamic and intelligent as your applications. Dyn DNS gets your users to the right cloud service, the right CDN, or the right data center, using intelligent response to steer traffic based on business policies, as well as real-time internet conditions, like the security and the performance of the network path. Dyn maps all internet pathways every 24 seconds via more than 500 million trace routes. This is the equivalent of 7 light years of distance, or 1.7 billion times around the circumference of the Earth. With over 10 years of experience supporting the likes of Netflix, Twitter, Zappos, Etsy, and Salesforce, Dyn can scale to meet the demand of the largest web applications. Get started with a free 30-day trial for your application by going to dyn.com slash sedaily. That's d-y-n dot com slash sedaily. After the free trial, Dyn's developer plans start at just $7 a month for world-class DNS. Rethink DNS. Go to dyn.com slash sedaily to learn more and get your free trial of Dyn DNS. Chris Dixon is a general partner at Andreessen Horowitz. Chris, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks for having me. You wrote an article called How Aristotle Created the Computer, and this was something that really intrigued me. So I want to start by talking about it. You argue that the history of computing can be thought of as a history of ideas rather than a history of objects. Yep. So if we were telling the history of computing through objects, we might talk about the transistor or the mouse or the iPhone, if we're telling a history of computing through ideas rather than objects, what are those ideas that we should be focusing on? Yeah, so, and and by the way, this is not to meant, I didn't mean in the the essay to take away from, obviously, the importance of things like the mouse and the transistor and the, you know, and the the abacus and the Babbage machine, and these things are all very important. I just had felt that, that a lot of the histories had sort of only focused on those aspects of it as opposed to what I think is sort of another important thread, which is how a lot of computing sort of core concepts of computer science came from mathematical logic and before that philosophy. And so the point of my essay is to try to kind of explain how that kind of the genealogy of those ideas and how they, you know, how how some of these kind of key ideas around computer science came from mathematical logic and philosophy dating back to Aristotle. And, and I kind of do that through the lens of two seminal papers from the 1930s, Alan Turing, his paper on computability, and, uh, and Claude Shannon's it's, uh, analysis of relay circuits, which are you know, widely considered to be 
you know, two, I guess, two of the most sort of in the canon of computer science, and also happened to ha come right at kind of this transition period when computers, these ideas were kind of going from theoretical to practical because, you know, of course, during World War II was when a lot of the kind of first real computers were built. And then you had the transistor and other kinds of things. And then, you know, <laughs> the rest is, was, was a sort of meteoric rise of computers and computer science. And so these two papers in particular, I, I see as a kind of transition, a key kind of transition period and have the nice feature of very clearly sort of spelling out where their own ideas came from. And I try to kind of, in the essay, kind of go through that, you know, sort of, I don't know, the history or genealogy or however you want to describe it of how those ideas kind of developed. It's pretty simple to draw a line from the insights of Claude Shannon or Alan Turing to where we are today and see their impact. Mm -hmm. It's less clear how you draw that line from Aristotle, but it, yeah. when you look at it from the point of view of Claude Shannon or Alan Turing standing on the shoulders of yeah. Aristotle, it's a little easier to intuit. So Aristotle yeah. started with the syllogism, which is A leads uh -huh. to B, B leads to C. That means A leads to C. Yeah. He phrased it as all men are mortal. Socrates is a man. Therefore, Aristotle is immortal. Why does the idea of the syllogism lead to eventually the iPhone? Yeah. Well, so first on the on the method, I'll, so just one, one thing I'll point out is and actually, I had an original version of this essay where I do much longer excerpts from the text, the primary sources themselves. But my claim that, like, for example, Claude Shannon comes from Aristotle, it's directly in Claude Shannon's paper. So he, <laughs> he has two, well, he, well, rather, he, he has directly in his paper, he, he has basically two footnotes. One of them is a logic textbook, and the other is George Boole, uh, who wrote a book called Laws of Thought in about, like, 80 years prior to Claude Shannon. Literally, those are the only two references in the paper. And, and the whole the whole paper is about how basically Shannon's insight that you can take Boolean logic. I mean, this sounds obvious to us today as people that know software engineering, but it wasn't obvious at the time. His insight was you can take Boolean logic and map it onto electrical circuits, right? And, and Claude Shannon actually says he had that insight because he took a philosophy class as an undergrad at University of Michigan and took this logic class. And this is sort of this esoteric thing, this guy, George Boole, who was trying to figure out and then by the way then you go read George Boole which I I, I do say you know I, I excerpt some in the in the essay and I went back and read all this stuff just if you just go back and read the preface of George Boole's Laws of Thought which is what Claude Shannon is talking about the whole thing's about Aristotle I mean like he literally says this book is an extension of Aristotle like it's not ambiguous and so you know I, I sort of uh, just want to emphasize that like this is not if you go read these texts it's, it's actually a very interesting exercise I, I, do, I like to do this a lot which is Go read historical texts, read the prefaces, read who they cite, and then compare that and sort of like, you know, think of it from a software engineering point of view. You're like drawing a list of pointers, like this class inherits this class or something, you know. And and if you go do that with the history, like it's often very – I find it's often very different than what the textbooks tell you. Anyway, so Claude Shannon like very clearly is saying, look, I'm I'm taking what Boole did and I'm – and I'm showing the kind of mapping onto electrical circuits. If you go read Bull, his book's called The Laws of Thought. And what he says in it, he says, look, Aristotle had this idea, which was that that kind of, you know, that that there were that there were underlying rules to how people think. In the same way that, you know, Newton had the insight that, you know, it's not just a coincidence that like the way an apple falls from a tree is you know, has similar mathematical properties to the way the, the moon, you know, orbits the earth or something, right? Like one of the, obviously what Newton did was he found these underlying mathematical principles. And what Aristotle was trying to do, you know, with his logic was to find these kind of underlying principles of how people think. And specifically, Aristotle's insight was that if you just look at the logical words, so logical words being words like and, or, therefore, not, if you just take the logical words, you can you can judge the validity of an argument just based on the logical words. Like it doesn't matter, you know, when you say, when you make a, an argument like Socrates is a man, all men are mortal, therefore Socrates is mortal, you can replace Socrates with some other um, yeah, person and the argument is still valid, right? And so then what Boole did was Boole said, you know, Boole came after the kind of Cartesian revolution in mathematics, which was, you know, kind of what Descartes did was was take really kind of introduced sort of modern, at least to the West, I should say, mo introduced modern kind of algebraic notation into mathematics. And Boole said, hey, why don't we take this kind of algebraic notation and extend what Aristotle did and, and go all the way instead of saying Socrates is a man, et cetera, like put in variables and put in mathematical operations. And then let's see, once we do that, you know, we're kind of uh, now unfettered by natural language and we can go and use all this 
this great machinery that mathematicians have built over the hundreds of years, uh, last the, the prior hundreds of years, and and really kind of explore how logic works. So that was what Boole was doing, and he and he very explicitly says that he saw his his project as an extension of Aristotle. And I think it's interesting too because and stop me if I'm going too long. I don't know. So I'm I could I could talk about this topic for a long time. But uh, the the other interesting thing I think if you read like a lot of modern textbooks, you know, obviously everyone knows Boole and there's Boolean operators in computer science and I mean in every programming language and things. But you know, you read about him today and people talking about like a mathematician and a or mathematical logician or something. If you go back and you look at the historical context, I mean he was kind of a wacky person who mm. there was no field of mathematical logic i mean there was literally nothing i mean there had been no work in logic period almost i mean may, you know there's a few of like people in like these like kind of religious figures in like the you know in like the 13th century or something but for the most part there had been no work in logic since aristotle it was not a field and you know kant emmanuel kant the great philosopher said you know logic began and ended with uh, aristotle like it was considered to be like a, a finished topic and so Boole was kind of this, you know, kind of crank, and I say this in a loving way, like a genius, but like, but at the time was sort of considered this strange person who thinks you can take, mix, you know, algebraic formulations with Aristotle and like do this. And why would you even want to do this is another big question people asked. But what happened is it kicked off a whole new kind of project, which is also something I write about in the essay, which is, you know, this whole kind of golden period of mathematical logic, which really began with Boole and led up through pe people like Gottlob Frege, who's who's sort of under underappreciated, you know, kind of massively important philosopher, logician, and then Bertrand Russell, who's more widely known, uh, who co-authored a book called The Principia Mathematica, which was kind of the real attempt to really build all of mathematics out of logic. Gödel, Kurt Gödel's incompleteness theorem is 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 kind of popular, is famously known, who that was sort of, you know, kind of maybe the end of the golden period, you want to say like 1860 to 1930-ish or something when, when his incompleteness theorem came out. But there, were, there was sort of this period where all these guys were working, and I can talk more about their project while they were working on it, where they, they, their actual goal was nothing to do with computers, nothing to do with anything practical, frankly. They were philosopher kind of logicians. But they basically built all of this machinery, which then Shannon and Turing through their insights, basically were able to say, hey, wait a second, all this machinery you built, we can just kind of shift it over <laughs> from like philosophy to computer science, electrical engineering, and and four years later, you have a working computer. And so these kind of papers and these insights they had were kind of, to me, the critical turning point where they took this very kind of theoretical thing that had happened and and had this this really important realization and that, that it could be applied practically. And that's, you know... And that really, really accelerated the development of com computers and computer science. As I was reading mm -hmm. the article, I found myself wondering, why is Chris Dixon spending his time <laughs> yeah. analyzing the history of computer science and tracing it back to logic? And yeah. because there's so many things you could think about in the present today that are exciting yeah. and groundbreaking and terrifying slash world impacting slash even just intriguing you know, why are you going into the past? And the, yeah. the the conclusion, reading between the lines that I drew, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, was if you look back at this, at this history, you see a number of instances where yeah. people had ideas that were initially regarded as trivialities or just That's had, right. like, totally useless. And it's interesting yeah. to look, the further you look back at a triviality, that ended up having an impact, the more you see that it just compounded into something really, really, really important. That's, yeah, no, that's, that's, that you couldn't, you said it very, very well. And I think actually, so the original title of the essay, and I was actually thinking of writing a series of essays, it, it was going to be something, I had this idea, like nothing interesting is a waste of time. And the kind of concept was exactly what you said, which is, if you go back and you look at so many things, which ended up having significant impact on the world, so many kind of intellectual ideas, so many, many, many of them started off as kind of tinkers, hobbyists, cranks, you know, and again, I'm saying these all in a positive way, you know, academics, researchers, intellectuals working on what a lot of people thought were just strange, esoteric projects. And yeah, and so like my day job is to try to, you know, I, I work at a venture capital firm in California, and we try to find technology companies to invest in. And so in some ways, my day job is to try to, you know, kind of predict the future to some extent. And I'm very interested in in trying to do that, and also just you know just as a person, I like I, my hobby is to read history, and I enjoy it. But but yeah, but but you're right. My like 
I, I think one, the best way to sort of try to predict the future is to understand the past. I mean, it's the only data set we have to analyze, right? And then two, I think there's this very common pattern. I think, you know, for example, I don't think the history has fully been written yet, but I think when it is, uh, the work going on with neural networks over, you know, let's call it 19, whatever, 40 through 2005 or something, you know, was, was th those guys, you know, a lot of them, these like Jeffrey Hinton and Jan LeCun and these, and, and Yashio Benjo, like these, these researchers were considered like kind of like this weird cultish side group of artificial intelligence. Like, why are they still working on neural networks when they're not working? And now it's like the center of all technology is, you know, deep learning, neural networks, et cetera. Like that will be another example, I think, you know, when the history is properly written of, of these people working on these sort of interesting things that seem like trivialities or something else. Machine learning itself, by the way, you know, I have a friend who was, who was doing machine learning in the, he's a professor at Penn, was doing machine learning in the 80s. I mean, it was like this weird cultish group, you know, uh, at the time in artificial intelligence, the kind of dominant the school of thought was believed you would you would be doing you would be building in kind of explicit knowledge you'd be you know explicitly teaching computers how to play chess through a set of like you know heuristics and other kinds of approaches as opposed to having a, a you know machine learn that seemed crazy and you know given the constraints they had around like CPUs and everything else storage etc back then it was kind of crazy um, but it, you know now machine learning is almost synonymous with AI it's so dominant computer graphics another great example that there's some great books about the University of Utah in the 70s where it, literally everyone from Apple to Pixar to Adobe, like all those people were working, they were all at University of Utah in the 1970s. Like every modern computer graphics, you know, kind of researcher slash company of, of significant impact was University of Utah in the 70s. And that was because, you know, some donor gave money to do computer graphics and it was this weird thing. And like this kind of like these 15 people in the world who, who were excited about computer graphics, they all just went to the one place where they could get a job and like all of this incredible stuff happened, right? And so... To me, it's this very common kind of repeating pattern where there's sort of a small group, of generally very, very smart people who are motivated kind of through very, what I would call kind of pure intellectual passions, you know, not sort of profit motive or even any kind of practical application who are kind of considered weird or trivial or something who end up creating all of these very important things. And, and I think that's, I think that is kind of the, you know, mathematical logic is that to kind of computer science. So in some ways it's kind of, of all these examples, maybe the biggest and most important one, because it kind of was the, you know, obviously computer science itself is, is kind of the big one when, you know, relative to, to these other trends. So that's exactly right. So like, so, so that, you know, that's sort of the broader idea. For years, when I started building a new app, I would use MongoDB. Now I use MongoDB Atlas. MongoDB Atlas is the easiest way to use MongoDB in the cloud. It's never been easier to hit the ground running. MongoDB Atlas is the only database as a service from the engineers who built MongoDB. The dashboard is simple and intuitive but it provides all the functionality that you need. The customer service is staffed by people who can respond to your technical questions about Mongo. With continuous backup, VPC peering, monitoring, and security features, MongoDB Atlas gives you everything you need from MongoDB in an easy-to-use service. And you can forget about needing to patch your Mongo instances and keep it up to date, because Atlas automatically updates its version. Check out mongodb.com slash sedaily to get started with MongoDB Atlas and get $10 credit for free. And even if you're already running MongoDB in the cloud, Atlas makes migrating your deployment from another cloud service provider trivial with its live import feature. Get started with a free three-node replica set. No credit card is required. As an exclusive offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners, use code SEDAILY for $10 credit when you're ready to scale up. Go to mongodb.com slash SEDAILY to check it out. And thanks to MongoDB for being a repeat sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It means a whole lot to us.
Yeah, and, and the esoteric ideas today that seem to be getting borne out, like you said, one is neural nets, and yep. another might be the cryptocurrency community. Yep, yep. And the, let's see, like the other, you know, there's probably genetic engineering or quantum yep. computing, these things, yep. or even space, where you can say, okay, yep. we are at a point where we've we've made some fundamental breakthroughs and the rest of the work is just incremental progress and we know how to make incremental progress. Does that sound accurate to you? No, absolutely. I think, you know, one interesting thing I, I wrestle with is I feel like the, the, the things that I'm arguing here, more people understand how this happens. And so, you know, one, one thing is that there are these sort of these kind of driving forces behind, let's just, I'm just talk here just about the computing industry, right? So there's things like Moore's law, you know, that just computers have gotten faster and, and, and Moore's law, by the way, is often, I think, kind of thought of just as like, you know, transistors, just as sort of what they call Dennard scaling of, you know, packing more transistors on the semiconductors, but really it's more of a broader kind of economic principle that just as the computing industry focuses on certain things like computing and networking and storage, you know, they've just gotten a lot better every, every year or two. And, you know, sorry, they've they doubled roughly every, you know, two years or something like this in terms of their performance. And so, you know, so as an example, you know, Skype back in 2002, you know, people had dial up networks and broadband penetration was, I don't know what, 10, 15% or something in the developed world. And computers didn't have microphones built in. I don't know, the, the routers would, would block, you know, peer to peer connections, there's a whole bunch of issues. But like, all that stuff got fixed. And Skype went from being kind of dismissed as a silly toy to, to you know, fundamentally Skype and things like it, replacing, uh, you know, landline phones as our primary form of communication. And, and so, you know, th that's an example where you can just kind of, or YouTube was originally like, you know, little dial up stuff and small, vi you know, bad quality video and not a great you know, library of content, you know, you could kind of see YouTube and project it forward and imagine how it would become something much larger. I think smartphones, another great example where, you know, the first version of the iPhone, right, it was only on AT&T and it dropped calls all the time and there were only a couple of apps. And But, you know, we've seen that movie before. We've seen the PC and the, and the Apple computer and all these other kinds of computing platforms grow. So, so some of it is just sort of like, you know, you kind of look at these trends and you see how they play out. I mean, I think the other thing I think a lot about is, so going back to like something like cryptocurrency, you know, I would argue that the, you know, the Ethereum, Bitcoin kind of broader cryptocurrency community, it's probably the largest and smartest software engineering organization in the world. I mean, there are probably 20,000 programmers, if not more, working on this stuff. And there's a lot of really, really smart people. I spend a lot of time with them and I'm just constantly impressed. And, you know, so like, do you want to bet against those 20,000 really smart engineers who are like, super passionate about this and working on it all the time. Like I wouldn't want to bet against them. And, you know, and, and I think the mistake people make is they look at these things and then they look at this technology as in a snapshot and they say, okay, well, you know, there's X, Y problems with Bitcoin or Ethereum. I don't know if you, Ethereum is just kind of newer cryptocurrency, which I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about. I'm very excited about. Sure. I've reported yeah. on a bunch. Okay. And so, you know, like there, yeah, you can go and you can make a big list of issues with Ethereum, but They've got a great development team. They've got a, a great community. I mean, you know, you could go back and imagine critiquing. I'm sure Linux had all sorts of problems over the years, you know, especially like when it was first created. You got to kind of look at these things as dynamic processes that evolve over time, right? And you got to sort of say, okay, given the trajectory and given, you know, who's working on it, what are the underlying trends? Like, you know, what are the winds that, at its back? What are the, the headwinds? And, you know, and sort of try to map that out and make a prediction as to where it can go. And is yeah. there is there some sort of pattern among the personalities of the people working on this? So like Claude Shannon or mm -hmm. Alan Turing certainly weren't motivated by money, or as far yeah. as I know. And and it almost seems, you know, in my interactions with the people in the cryptocurrency community, the people who are most influential don't seem to be concerned with money at all. It's either part, you know, maybe part of it is intellectual curiosity, but frankly it almost seems like they're more interested in just like, hey, let's see what happens when we like mess this thing up and like let's just like let's just like destroy yeah. the status quo. They're well, really interested yeah. in just like poking the status yeah. quo and seeing what changes. I, I think there's I don't yeah I think there's there's definitely an element of the community that's 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 sort of uh, you know disruptive or something. The uh, I, I think you're right. They're not motivated by money. I mean, look, I mean, people have made money on cryptocurrency, but if you any rational person, let's say in 2011, and like I want to make money, like you were. <laughs> 
cryptocurrency, which is like a completely crazy idea, to, right? Way to do it. Um, you go work on Wall Street or something, right? It just, it just was not a rational strategy. Now, it turns out in retrospect that people have made money in cryptocurrency, but but no, no, like it's very hard to imagine any rational person sitting down and saying, okay, well, I'm going to go make money. How should I do it? I'm going to go find this, you know, cryptographically secured, like, you know, distributed ledger and I'm going to buy a bunch of units on it. And like, it just would not have been like a likely candidate for any rational person. So almost by necessity, like it's, you know, it's, it's, I mean, almost by like definition, the people that are, that have made money on it are people that didn't care about money and they cared about like, you know, distributed systems and cryptography and all the other kinds of things. And, and uh, yeah, and I, I, you know, Claude Shannon was a pure researcher and as was Alan Turing and they were, you know, they were, I think they were motive. I mean, I, you know, I've read history biographies of them. I haven't obviously didn't <laughs> can't peer into their soul or didn't know them, but, but from everything I could tell, they were motivated by, you know, pure research, uh, you know, pure kind of intellectual, like, you know, like, I think like a lot of sort of philosophers, mathematicians, computer scientists, they were almost motivated by kind of aesthetics. They were building kind of these beautiful structures and, you know, I think like you think about what Shannon, I mean, I think what was so interesting about Shannon, if you look also, if you read his, uh, you know, the later work on information theory, it's just, he's such a fresh, original thinker. I mean, what's so beautiful about the symbolic analysis of relay circuits paper that I, that I talk about, I, I'd encourage your readership. I think it, you just Google it and you find it and just even read the first couple pages. I mean, it's just, it's a, it's just great because like the whole idea, you get it in like two paragraphs, you know, it's not like, it's, it's such a big, beautiful idea that you can map boolean logic onto electrical circuits i mean he was the first one just think of this like this way like we take it for granted in software engineering now that there's a separation between the logical and the physical layer right like that mm -hmm. that was that was what the paper was he was the first one to make that distinction he was the first one to realize that the other thing i mean the other thing we, we take it for granted that the, the whole idea of digital circuits right it's actually a very counterintuitive idea not to us today because we've kind of grown up with it but I mean, think about it originally, like you're throwing out like what, what you're doing when you when you convert, a, you know, a transistor to a zero or one state is you're throwing out a ton of information, right? Nature is continuous valued. It's not it's not binary. And to throw out all of that information is a very non engineering thing to do. Right? Like and there's a lot of like waste in, in a sense in, in making a turning an analog system into a digital system. But there's a huge advantage, which is what Shannon saw, which is you can is that at, by the time he, he wrote that paper, people had shown that you could build all of mathematics on top of Boolean logic, like literally from the pieces of Boolean, you know, from it actually has been shown now, you know, and we know this computer science and AND gate, you just need one Boolean operation and you can construct the other Boolean operations. You can, you can construct arithmetic, you know, what we call an arithmetical logic unit, right? Which is a key part of a CPU. Like, but that was all shown by logicians, right? Like logicians had done that, like Piano's Axiom. So Piano's an Italian logician who showed, he kind of basically built ALUs, arithmetical logic units, before there were ever, you know, before Shannon's paper, before there were electrical circuits. They built all this machinery up. So they had shown, in the Principia Mathematica, they had shown you could build all of mathematics out of the Boolean operators. And so what Shannon said was, oh my God, like if we, if, if we, if electrical circuit can represent a one and a zero, and he actually has this very simple chart in this paper where he just shows whenever the circuit is open, that represents, you know, and, and like it's just maps each of the Boolean operations onto, onto different, you know, circuits. And so, so his insight was, okay, we're going to pay this price. And at first it seems counterintuitive. We're going to throw out the, the continuous valued nature of nature and analog systems and replace them with digital systems. But in return, we get this, these other people have created this machinery that show that like you can model all of mathematics. And by the way, if you believe Boole, I mean, the book was called The Laws of Thought. You can model all of human thought if you believe Aristotle and Boole, like people hadn't done it yet. We may be doing it now, by the way, but at the time no one had done it. But like that was the theory really in some ways Aristotle had and Boole had was that, that like once you can kind of get the basic logical operations, you can model human thought, right? Mm -hmm. The laws of thought. And so, so what Shannon, I mean, the really deep thing, Shannon, I mean, I think it's one of the deepest insights in the 20th century. I don't know. I think what Shannon did is, is unbelievable. Like, so, you know, in some ways, what you can see is that Shannon realized that by converting circuits from, from analog to digital, you know, you can now start to think about electrical systems that think yeah, really, right? I mean, because once you've got logic, you've got thought, you know, it's taken now, whatever, it'll be a hundred years, but I think in, I think a hundred years from when he wrote that paper and 2036, we probably will have machines that we say are thinking, and it's, mm. and it's in, many, in many ways due to, you know, Claude Shannon. You know, I think some of these ideas are easier to look at in a historical context and say, oh, 
of like of course that worked that way or of course yeah. that didn't work. One example I think about is I remember in computer architecture class the professor said something about yeah, you know, there was a period of time where people were messing around with ternary systems a lot. Like it wasn't you didn't just <laughs> yeah. have like zeros and ones, you had zeros, yeah. ones and twos and it's like, well, maybe that works. Like that in at some level it seems like okay, cool, you can make more op codes or something. Yep. Like isn't that great? And and then didn't work. But then here we are with quantum computing where it yeah. feels like that's something similar and like I don't know where to draw the analogies that are valid because we're coming from the present and it's harder to evaluate at present time rather you know relative to the historical context. Yeah, you know it's 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 fascinating there's a whole field actually I did my I was in a PhD program when I was when I was younger and in uh, in philosophy and I dropped out of my PhD program but I uh what I was actually focusing on was what was called non-classical logics. And so there's a whole field of, of logic where you don't, you just, you, you just sort of change the assumptions. And so, for example, you t- mentioned the ternary system. Like there are systems like where you have values like true, false, and neither as an example, right? And there are, there's like, you know, and there, it turns out there, you know, there's what's called modal logic, which is the logic that you add in kind of concepts of like necessarily and possibility as an example, mm-hmm. possibly as an example, there's logics for ethics. There's logics for quantum computing. And I wouldn't be surprised, you know, by the way, it's, it's very analogous. Like, I, it wouldn't shock me if it turns out later on that one of these really crazy non-classical logical systems ends up being a really core thing, you know, maybe quantum computing, maybe, maybe AI, maybe something else. To give you, to give you another historical analogy, um, you know, Einsteinian uh, physics, right, it uses non-Euclidean geometry. Now, where non-Euclidean geometry is much like non-classical logic, right, it's just to give the brief history of it, right, Euclid sort of was the, you know, obviously created the, the, the element, wrote the elements, which is the great kind of classical text on geometry. He had five axioms. Mathematicians spent, I don't know, almost, what, 2,000 years being skeptical of the, of the, the what's called the parallel postulate, <laughs> because the other postulates all seem simple and elegant, and this one, parallel postulate, two lines, two parallel lines never cross, always seemed suspicious, and they always were sort of saying, hey, can we derive this fifth postulate from the other four? And then eventually in the 19th century, people said, hey, why don't we just get rid of this postulate and see what happens? And that was when you had this whole kind of mathematical area called non-Euclidean geometry. And um, and so there was, you know, all these, and it's like, it's very hard to kind of picture these things. And they just seemed like these curiosities in the same way that non-classical logic seems like curiosities today. And then Einstein came along and like it turned out, it actually was the, you know, the best way to describe the real world. <laughs> um, and so... You know, it's another great example where this kind of stuff. So I, I don't know. I, I'm not trying to actually make a prediction about that. But mm. but I think the, the point you make is a great one. And that it very well could be that, like, you know, there, there's some, you know, thing that we consider some weird logical system today that turns out once you have quantum computers, once you have maybe, you know, a lot of the stuff going on in AI now, like they're kind of resurrecting a lot of, you know, other interesting ideas from other areas of academia. So, you know, you, know, you just don't know where these mm. things will go. And I, I kind of think of it as like these really smart kind of uh, purist, kind of quirky, cultish groups like the logicians and the non-including geometers and the, the neural network people prior to 2010, et cetera, you know, they're just sort of creating these, like all this conceptual machinery. Um, and then, you know, when the right kind of uh, real world factors kind of comes, you know, something happens and there's like a new breakthrough and there's a new need or there's new what, suddenly like, and there's someone comes along and says, hey, look at all this stuff and we can bring it over and and boom, you know, make something, make something great. Spring is a season of growth and change. Have you been thinking you'd be happier at a new job? If you're dreaming about a new job and have been waiting for the right time to make a move, go to Hired.com slash SE Daily today. Hired makes finding work enjoyable. Hired uses an algorithmic job-matching tool in combination with a talent advocate who will walk you through the process of finding a better job. Maybe you want more flexible hours, or more money, or remote work. Maybe you want to work at Zillow, or Squarespace, or Postmates, or some of the other top technology companies that are desperately looking for engineers on Hired. You and your skills are in high demand. You listen to a software engineering podcast in your spare time, so you're clearly passionate about technology. Check out Hired.com slash SE Daily to get a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. A $600 signing bonus from Hired 
when you find that great job that gives you the respect and the salary that you deserve as a talented engineer. I love Hired because it puts you in charge. Go to Hired.com slash SE Daily and thanks to Hired for being a continued long-running sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. When it gets that esoteric, like when you're talking about something like quantum computing mm -hmm. or certain like niche topics in the crypto community, is there a certain point where you have to just say, I, I don't understand this, I'm not going to be able to understand it, but I'm going to make a bet on a person? Or I, I guess it's just a multi Are you saying in my, in my job as a, in as your a venture job. capitalist? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I think in my job for sure. Um, I think that it's sort of a, it's, it's a, you know, so much of it, it ends up being a bet on people. And mm -hmm. I, I even look back on, you know, both good and bad investments I've made. And, and I, it's funny, like even the good ones I've made, like I go back and I read, I, you know, I always write like a memo as to why I'm making the investment, mm -hmm. uh, you know, like an internal memo just to kind of describe it. You know, it's just a couple, couple page kind of thing, like describing the, the concept behind it. And even when I'm right, like it's usually, I'm usually wrong. Like in the sense of like, even when the investment works out, it's, you know, the theory behind it, like it just the world is so hard to predict that mm -hmm. like, and usually the one thing, the one thing that usually when I look back on those memos, I, if I, if I'm right, I got right was the people, you know, mm -hmm. like it seems, you know, it seems like virtual reality will be a big thing. And these seem like the people that would do it. And then you try to go and be more specific about how the particular product's going to play out and how the competition's going to play out and kind of everything else besides the people and the general kind of direction, it's very, very hard to predict. You know, with uh, I'm investors in a company called Coinbase, which is a, you know, Bitcoin kind of cryptocurrency company. And it's a similar thing. Like we invested four years ago and it was just, the, you know, really, really smart, passionate team. They were true believers. They were involved from the beginning. They were highly technical, didn't know where it would go, knew there was something interesting happening in the movement. And, you know, they've done a really great job and been, they've been successful. Um, and what's what's funny about that example is it probably seems like it's even less clear where the company is going to go today. Is it going to be a crypto token holding company? Is it, or may, I don't know. Maybe you know more than no, I no, do. You're, no, you're right. No, you're. <laughs> I mean, look, it's it's still. I would still say it's it's the nine. It, if if cryptocurrency is like the internet, we're still in the 1980s, right? I, right. I, I think it's still very early. So, uh, you know, they've got a plan and everything else, but like it's you know it's early. I mean, there's a, there's going to be a lot more twists and turns if you told me three years ago that like ethereum would be where it is today you know i thought you were crazy and like and all the other stuff happening and like just the innovation so it's just the rate of innovation is so high who knows right yeah so i, I want to talk about crypto tokens a little bit i know we're we're most of the way through our time but yeah no i love you, it this might be one of my favorite topics <laughs> yeah so. you, you wrote about it recently and it was a really clarifying yeah. article that i'll put in the show notes the kind of the the line that you draw is that Crypto tokens are kind of a way to do decentralized state management. I mean, the, yep. block the blockchain allows you to do decentralized state management, but the crypto tokens are the, the building blocks for that decentralized yep. state management, or at least more formal, higher level building blocks. So state yep. management, the way it works on the internet today, one way you could look at it is like, Facebook, which is like a proprietary way to manage the state of your public profile. Explain what the difference between that example and a decentralized state yeah. management system is. First, let me say, like, I, I think, and I'll just I talk about this in the blog post, but I think we're living in a very centralized period. I think it's even more centralized than the Microsoft period of the 90s. Um, and just so what I mean by that is the strength of Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, you know, they're stronger than ever. And you just look at, and if you're a software developer today and you look, you're, you're dependent on, if you're building an iOS or Android, you're dependent, they take 30%, they can, they can kick you off the platform. God help you. If you're building on a social network, like Facebook or Twitter, like I had a bunch of friends who tried to do that, like eight years ago, they all got like, you know, kicked off or whatever. No, no rational people are still trying to do that. I hope it's just a, it's just a very, you know, if you're building a, a, infrastructure, you know, like a infrastructure company, you know, Amazon will just take an open source version and add it to AWS. And like, you know, so it's just a very, we're living in a very centralized era. And I, I think that's, I, I personally, like I'm in the minority in Silicon Valley on this. I think that's a bad thing for the world. 
And it's not because of some radical political beliefs. I just think it's bad for innovation because if you go back and you look at it, you know, Google was started in a garage in Menlo Park and Facebook was started in a dorm room. Like the, inter- this, this, the fact that the internet was open, it is open and, uh, and accessible to like any kind of hobbyist and tinker has been a wonderful thing for the world and has allowed all sorts of innovation to flourish. And I think we need to maintain that. I think it's very important. So I think right now, like, I think there are virtues to centralization. We get these awesome products like, you know, the iPhone's great, Facebook's great, Instagram's great, but I think it's kind of a sugar high. Like it's good for now, but long-term it's going to hurt us. And so I'm very interested in things that, that, that provide, you know, a possible new kind of way to, to open up decentralization. So that, that said, I was very involved in, so, you know, I've been involved in technology now for, for, I don't know, 15, 20 years or something in the, in the industry, in the startup industry. And so I was very, I was very involved, let's call it 2007. There was a moment where, where, you know, social networks had become a thing. It was like Facebook, my, uh, sorry, Friendster, MySpace, Facebook, but there were also like RSS, friend of a friend. There were these open protocols that were vying for it. And if you go back and you read, and I cite these, some of these in my blog posts, there, there, there were, if you read the blog posts and the kind of news articles at the time, like it was a real open question in 2007, which way social networking would go. You know, would it go the way of SMTP? Would it be like email? So there's an open, you know, kind of protocol that's like, you know, how you store your friends graph and everything else. And you choose which client you want to use. And, you know, it's like the way we use SM, email and Gmail, et cetera, or of course, what happened is it went the other way and it went centralization one and Facebook one. And so, you know, why is that? And, and you know, the obvious answer is Facebook built a better product. Um, but why did they build a better product? And I'd argue that it's because the, the, the open side, which I was part of, I mean, I was there. So just by the way, like, so I, I you know, this, this is something that, that I, I feel like I, you know, I don't know, like I, a topic I, I have some understanding of, I guess. But like I was there and I was on the sort of open side and I was trying to work on stuff. The open side was fighting kind of with one arm tied behind his back. So just to give you an example, you talked about state management. Like, let's just say you were in 2007, you wanted to create a Twitter competitor using open protocols. And so the basic functionality you want is a person comes on and they claim a username. So like I'm C. Dixon, right? How do you do that on the open internet, right? Like there's no open database that everyone, there is one, there's DNS, right? There's DNS is the only one, right? Like there's no, oh, there's no sort of shared resource database, right? There's DNS and there's DNS. And so if you look at all these things, everyone tries to overload DNS once once again. So email uses DNS, websites use DNS. And if you go look at friend of a friend and I don't know, XML and RSS and everything else, they were all saying, okay, create a website. And on that website, you know, create this XML code that shows your friend list and everyone's going to put that on their website. And then the these crawlers are going to go and aggregate it all. And that's how we're going to create the friend graph, right? But that required every all this massive coordination. Each user had to do this, and and you were and poor DNS like was once again being asked to kind of do the work of the only kind of shared state on the internet, right? It's the only shared database on the internet, right? And so, I'm sorry when I say shared, I mean like open, not controlled by any. I mean, yeah, there's some control over you know, but 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 something you can sort of like when you when you have your domain name, when you have I'm C Dixon, I'm I'm I have C Dixon.org, like I own it, like it's a you know, it's not. Facebook's property, right? And so what cryptocurrency does and blockchains and things like the, the sort of the underlying architecture along with a lot of, I mean, I think the kind of blockchain thing has been overhyped a little bit. Like there's other aspects that are important about cryptocurrency besides the blockchain. But but one of the many things that cryptocurrency does is it allows you to provide like a, a state. So if you wanted to create a Twitter or Facebook today in an open way, it'd be very easy to say, okay, I'm, you know, I am C. Dixon. I claim that username here's my friend graph and you could share, you could store all this stuff on blockchain. There's a whole bunch of different blockchains you could store it on. And it would be open in the sense that there's no single kind of, you know, for-profit company that can control it and take it away from you. But it has the benefits of centralization that you can like create a name and it's simple and it's quick and you could create these really like modern, there's no reason you couldn't build like a modern client around it. And it would feel like, you know, software made by Facebook or something in the terms of, of the quality, but then it would have the, uh, the the benefits of being not controlled by Facebook, which I think would also be really useful for the world. And so there's been just a lot of really, really interesting, uh, I think, kind of core infrastructure work. Now, it's still in the infrastructure phase. Like it's not, you know, people, it's, it, we're basically building infrastructure. When I say we, the cryptocurrency community right now, at some point it will move into the kind of end user application phase, but their infrastructure is not done. I think we still got a couple more years of that. And, and that, that's sort of this whole, and there's this, there's, uh, there's this other really interesting concept, which is the concept of tokens, which is kind of this thing that started with Bitcoin, but now has moved beyond it. And a lot of it's around the kind of Ethereum ecosystem, 
which is another really interesting idea, which is, you know, if you look at these platforms like, you know, any platform in the history of computers, so platform being kind of, you know, a, a network that connects developers and users. So it could be an operating system, it could be a social network, it could be a whatever, you know, any time that users and, and developers interact with each other through, through kind of a, a centralized uh, gateway, that's a platform. So if you kind of you go back and you look at the history of platforms, and this is like operating systems and social networks and whatever, like there's basically just constant battles that go on between the different participants on the network. So just to go back to Microsoft as an example, you know, they obviously, you know, had Windows and they had Office and they had these big battles with the, the kind of the killer apps on their platform. So like, for example, uh, Intuit and Quicken, there were all these like, Microsoft money was trying, they were trying to take out those guys for a long time. They had big epic battles with Netscape. Um, and so like the way I would describe it is if you actually look at the most kind of vicious battles in the history of tech, I don't know, vicious, but like whatever, aggressive battles in the history of technology, they're often between what kind of economists call complements, which is like products that work together, like an operating system and an application. And so like, you know, I, I like to say like the, the, the most vicious battles in technology are not between the hamburger and the hot dog, they're between the hot dog and the hot dog bun. Like the two things that go together actually end up having like the most, anyways, and so you see that again, like Facebook and Zynga. I don't know if you followed that whole that whole saga. Yeah. Um, Twitter and TweetDeck and all the other kind of Twitter clients and things and the battles there. So one of the so so basically this is this constant thing in technology where you build a platform, the applications come along, you know, and then you know, or if you're a developer on iOS and you built like a cool whatever calendar app or voice app and then apple built built the same thing and kind of knocked you off like every wwdc like there's like who got killed today you know or something right so there's like there's like this weird like kind of thing where it's like symbiotic but then also like adversarial between every platform and their applications built on top of it right and you just spend a lot of time i've written lots of blog posts about this you just spend a lot of time kind of watching these these kind of platform wars play out and so one of the other beautiful things about cryptocurrency is the idea of tokens. And so the idea of a token is, is like, is this, is this literally like, it's, it's like a token that is, that is like a, a thing you can buy uh, that you can own or you can be given. And the token has value and can appreciate and is traded on an open market. And the way these, these new cryptocurrency networks work is their systems for kind of giving out and selling the tokens. And so, you know, the way Bitcoin works is miners, who are people that kind of are the service providers who host Bitcoin, so to speak, get paid tokens every day in exchange for what they're doing. And in the way that, that a lot of these new tokens are working is like the development team will hold 10% of the tokens for themselves to fund the development. They'll give some portion of the tokens over time to miners who provide the services. The applications built on top of it, those people will just buy tokens or be granted tokens or whatever. And then the tokens are freely traded on these on these token exchanges and can and and what so what's beautiful about this model is that it aligns the uh, incentives of all the participants so that all of the participants in the network the core developers the third party developers the service providers i.e. aka miners the users they all they all have the the incentive for all of them is to make the token more valuable and instead of fight each other for, you know, whatever profits there are, the way that has happened on every other platform in history. And I think that's why, one reason why Bitcoin has surprised people. You know, everyone is, there's an art, there's a Tumblr that's like 120 times Bitcoin has been dead. And it's like the, it, it's a sort of funny little Tumblr, but it's like- Bitcoin obituaries. Yeah, yeah, Bitcoin obituary, right? So it's like mainstream media has had like literally every month there's like a obituary of Bitcoin. And of course, it's now at an all-time high and it will continue to be. And the, I think that the the thing that they underestimate is, yes, it's, yes, it's you know, cryptographic money and yes, blah, 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 all these arguments against gold standard and kind of they trot out all these kind of tulip bulbs and everything else. What they don't, what they don't get is the power of an aligned network. Uh, having millions of people with the same aligned incentives who are also super active internet users and all these other things they have all the, and they're programmers and you know you get a, you get a million programmers who are all aligned like it's a very powerful force in the modern world and I think they underestimate that and I think that's what this sort of token thing is doing now is it's sort of taking that beyond Bitcoin and applying it to other areas hmm. and it's very exciting like if you look at Brendan Ike the creator of JavaScript you know he just did a token that's called the attention token like I, by the way I don't know if any of these will work and I'm not I should also say I don't recommend people go buy these tokens. I'm not sort of giving financial advice. I think it's all very speculative. We're venture capitalists. You know, we we take risks and expect to lose money on a lot of our investments. But but I think it's very exciting what people are doing. I think like what Brendan's trying to do, for example, is he, he wants to, you know, he wants to fix the way that that monetization works in, on the internet. And you think about the stuff going on now where 
you know, you, you go to a, you're, you're on Twitter, you click on a link and you get all these pop-up ads. And so you're, maybe you're running an ad blocker. And then meanwhile, like journalists aren't getting paid enough and it's just, you know, and then like, I don't know. And the only people it seems to be working for are like Google and Facebook. Right. And so, you know, the, it's not working for the journalists. The users aren't that happy. So like, you know, maybe we took a wrong turn. I think what Brendan is arguing, I'm not, I don't want to speak for him, but he's, take, he's arguing is maybe we took a wrong turn when we bet on these like banner ads and yeah. all this other kind of stuff. I kind of think we did. I, I don't think they're particularly good for users. They aren't particularly good for, for like creators, like writers yeah. and journalists. And by the way, it's a really important thing. Like we need a way to fund journalism. Like we need a way to fund, uh, you know, creative people, right? We need to like, the internet should be the greatest thing that ever happened to those people because now they can be, you know, there's 3 billion people with smartphones, right? Uh, you can write an article. It's a miracle. We, you know, we have we walk around with these supercomputers in our pockets with access to like more information than like the president of the United States had 20 years ago or something, right? Like it's a miracle that what what's happened, and it should be that you know anyone can write something now, and three billion people can read it uh, instantly, and this should be a wonderful thing for people that are creative. It should be a wonderful thing, you know, for what you're doing on your podcast for people creating videos, people writing things like this, people creating music, you know, people creating art, like. This should be a, this should be a golden age for those people, and and and, and it is in some ways, and the, the their work is able to be exposed more broadly. But the on the sort of monetization side, making money, like it has not been a good thing for them, and and and, and I think there's two kind of views of that. One is it's just the nature of the internet, and it it just is a you know you're trading they they say digital do- or whatever analog dollars for digital pennies, and just I, I just don't believe that. I've heard that my whole career. I heard I remember people saying that search would never make money, and Google of course did, and I heard people remember people saying social networks never make money. I remember people saying video games never make money. There were two you know video game companies last year sold for ten billion dollars. You know that that you know, and they said micropayments never work, and that's of course how video games all make money now, and like. You know, it just I, I just don't believe it. Like, I think that, that when people say they entered something magical about the Internet that makes it not make money for Category X, I just think we haven't figured it out yet. Right. I, I believe that. And I, I just spent my entire career being told X will never make money on the Internet. And it's just always been wrong. And I just don't believe it. I, I think once you get I just think once you get the user so like micropayments, a great example. Everyone said it would never work. Like this is what, what like Clash of Clans is like. I don't know. It's like three billion, three billion in revenue this year off micropayments. Like once you make it, you just need the right user experience. You need the right set of incentives. You need the right, you know, platform. You know, I mean, who would have imagined that like these little ads on the side of the page on search engines would be whatever eighty billion this year in revenue on this? I mean, it, it would have just. I would have sounded just insane. Anyone who described the world we live in would have sounded insane. So I realize I sound insane, but I think we are going to enter a period where I, I think we're going to enter a period where it's going to be a golden age. And I, I think it's incumbent on us as, you know, people in the technology community to, to try to find this future. Yeah. But I believe there is a future there that we can find if we do the right things, which will make the internet a wonderful thing for creative people, both in terms of getting exposure and in terms of, you know, providing financial support for them. And so, I think, and I think this is the most promising movement, and that's one of the many reasons I'm excited about this movement. And, and that is probably what's motivating most of those 20,000 developers that are working on cryptocurrencies on a regular basis. Um, oh, yeah. They, it's, it's a, by the way, it's a fiery, revolutionary, exciting movement. Like, you talk to these people, and they're like, I mean, they're just, like, fired up, and they're like, we're yeah. going to save the world. I mean, you know, may, maybe they're right or wrong or whatever, but, like, and, you know, they're, like, coming. It's a really interesting thing, too, is it's not based in Silicon Valley. I would say it's more Europe and Asia, you know, New York, like, you know, like a lot of it, like, Vita- I don't know, Vitalik was, I think he was in Canada, then Switzerland, or I don't even know where he is, and then <laughs> the Ethereum, and then, you know, the Gavin, I think, is in Berlin, and like, so also the whole, the core team of like Ethereum, they're all over the, they're all over the world, but not in Silicon Valley. We don't know where Satoshi is, obviously, or who, who Satoshi is. But, you know, generally, like, if you just look and you kind of headcount all the kind of key people in this movement, very few are in Silicon Valley. So it's really this kind of global movement. Yeah. It's led by technologists. They, they really believe they're, you know, I think they're very passionate about it, kind of ideologically based in, like, this kind of utopian ideological vision, which, you know, a lot of people make fun of it. I think it's very real and serious and you know and there's just the rate of stuff that's coming the idea generation and just the excitement is just it's just very high and and it's just and it's high quality software like go look at you know and like stuff vitalik writes and if you go look at the code and it's all you know there's a lot of really really stuff good stuff being written so yeah all right chris well thank you so much for coming on software engineering daily it's been really fun talking to you i've, I've been, a, been a fan of your stuff for a while yeah it's my pleasure it's been fun
deep learning is at the forefront of evolving computing and promises to dramatically improve how our world works. In order to get us to that bright future, we need new kinds of hardware and new interfaces between this AI hardware and the higher level software. That's why Intel acquired Nirvana Systems, a platform for deep learning. Intel Nirvana is hiring engineers to help develop this full stack for AI, from chip design to software frameworks. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel to apply for a job at Intel Nirvana. If you don't know much about Intel Nirvana, you can check out the interviews that I've conducted with engineers from Intel Nirvana. And those are available at softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel as well. Come build the future of AI and deep learning at Intel Nirvana. Go to softwareengineeringdaily.com slash intel and apply to work at Intel Nirvana. Thanks to Intel Nirvana for being a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily, and I've really enjoyed the interviews I have done with the Intel Nirvana staff. I think you'll enjoy them too.